Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, it sounds much better. Sounds okay. Ça va, vous m'entendez Je sais, je peux pas trop le mettre plus bas là. Je le mette sur le. Ok, cool. Ah oui, petite folle mine. All right, so let's continue with, a, here is Camille Mal. Welcome, Camille. Thank you. He's a CNRS researcher in the University of Bordeaux. He's a specialist of free probability. So we go more from the, let's say, physics side up to the, the actual mathematics side. I so, so. And uh, welcome, and we're looking forward to, to know about free probability. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So I will present you uh, a subject, which is at the intersection of uh, free probability and random matrix theory. Free probability can be developed a part of uh, random matrix theory, and I will introduce you the general context to put the, the setting. So the kind of problem you should, uh, con where you should consider free probability to solve a, a random matrix problem is the following. Imagine you are given a matrix. Uh, that is written as a polynomial in several matrices, a matrix A1n, ALN. For me, big N is the size of the matrices. They are all of size N by N. So and this size is going to tend to infinity. Okay. So you, you assume that you have a matrix of this form where uh, P is a fixed uh, function. And let's say a uh, non-commutative is a fixed non-commutative polynomial or fractional or rational function if you want to generalize this. So what is a non-commutative polynomial? You just make a product of matrices and you know that the order in the product matters. This is why we say non-commutative and you do linear combination of this. Okay. And uh, the kind of assumption we want to make on the AA is not really specifying a model, but having uh, a generic position. And ad addressing the question of what does that mean being generic position is quite rich, and there are different levels that we are going to consider. But what is important for us is that the matrices uh, A, uh, Ln, so these matrices, we assume they are independent. And this is really what we want to do. Independent random matrices. So this is several, uh, sometimes called the several matrices problem because several matrices are involved. What we want to understand is the spectrum of this matrix when the size goes to infinity. So maybe you are, use, you are um, this is common for you, but if not, let me remind you the notion of uh, empirical eigenvalue distribution. Of a matrix HN, say. So this is a probability measure. I will denote it L index HN. And so it is the sum of Dirac mass with weight one over N on the eigenvalues. So delta is the Dirac mass, and the lambda I of HN is the nth eigenvalue of HN. In all the talk, I will assume that the matrices I want to compute the spectrum are uh, Hermitian matrices, because otherwise it's a different problem, much more complicated. So we, we uh, just consider this. Uh, moreover, this is a random probability measure. If uh, HN is a random matrix, I would rather consider the expectation of this guy. And if you're interested in the random guy, uh, you just 
build on this construction and try to find concentration. And just what is the meaning of that? It's just uh, if you evaluate a function, it's just the expectation of one over n, the sum of f applied on the eigenvalue. Well, here it is. Um, so what will be the, the strategy? The strategy is given by the theory of free probability by Voiculescu. We start constructing this setting, the abstract setting in the 80s and apply it uh, 10 years later in random matrices, just to say that the theory exists before. And the idea is to see, to, um, to consider a notion of limit, a notion of limit for the matrices when the size goes to infinity, and to consider a random matrix, not like um, uh, a collection of a huge number of random variables, but just as a single random variable of a different nature than what you do classically in probability, uh, a random variable which is non-commutative. So, okay, this is just a construction of the spirit, but it comes with a notion which is the analog of independence in a very deep sense. Uh, so I don't have a lot of space in this tiny blackboard, so let me just uh, organize this like this. So everyone is, I suppose, familiar with the notion of classical probability. Where we have the concept of law of random variable, which is important. Voiculescu created this context of non-commutative probability. The interest is that the concept that you know here have analogs in this uh, place, and analogs not in an obvious way, which, which have their own mathematics. And sometimes there are some things that you, a problem where it is difficult to compute on that side, but much easier on this side. This is what we discover with this eigenvalue problem. But what is important to note here is that in this uh, context, you know, you have classical independence. The expectation of the product is the product of expectation. Here we have a notion that we call freeness or free independence. The definition is much more complicated that the expectation of the product is the product of expectation. But there is a definition. And this uh, notion is as strong as this one, you know, is strong in probability. There is a notion of Gaussian random variable, as you know, or Gaussian processes. Let me say random variable. Here, there is an analog that we will discover during this first lecture today with this classical GUE or Wigner matrices in the limit when the size goes to infinity, there is an abstract object which replaces the Gaussian process and which describes the eigenvalues of these matrices when we consider such a generic problem. This is what we call a semi-circular system, or circular system for non-emission matrices. Okay, so we will discover this. What, do, what can we mention also? Something uh, we... Uh, Mark mentioned this uh, this morning. You have the convolution of uh, random variable, which is what explains the distribution of the sum of uh, independent random variable. Okay, if you have a, a measure mu and a measure nu, you know what is the convolution of this, and you know what is described. In this context, you have the free convolution, which is a different rule, but which plays the analog role. On, we will denote this operation differently because it's a different operation. It is a boxed convolution, an operation between two measures that give you one measure, such that if you have two matrices, two random matrices, which are in the context of this topic, let's say a rotational invariant, and you're interested in the distribution of the sum of these two matrices in a generic position, and in the limit when the size goes to infinity, this is the free convolution that will give you this answer. This is just a notion for us right now. How to compute this and how to compute this when we are not just in this context will be the subject of, uh, the, the, of these lectures. Okay, we heard uh, some uh, notions of uh, subordination property this morning. This is what we will go into explore. Okay, but this work, this context of freeness 
under kind of uh, robust uh, um, on uh, kind of strong assumptions. This context is no longer applicable. It happens from kind of, kind of classical matrices that you can construct easily, that when you consider the distribution of the sum, it is not given by the free convolution. And this is the kind of ensemble that I want to focus on uh, during this week. So this is applicable when for the matrices under consideration, the eigenvector vector basis, the random matrices are asymptotically so, uniform. So, this is um, a heuristic and this is not a precise definition. What does that mean being uh, asymptotically uniform? I'm not going to precise this, but your random matrices, if you look at the eigenvectors, they are very, they should be to, to apply this theory, very close to what happens if you sample it uniformly, independently of the, uh, of the uh, eigenvalue. I will introduce some natural uh, uh, example of matrix model for which this is not true. And so we cannot apply this. And to solve this question, I will talk about a third generation of, of, of probability theory. I call it traffic probability. And this guy comes with another notion of independence. And this notion of independence is uh, much richer than what we do in these two contexts, because the notion of law of distribution is much richer. We are not just considering uh, moments. We are considering something that we introduce that uh, take much more information in the matrices. And if you take much more information of the matrices, you are able to describe much more um, of a good variety of phenomena. What happens is that this notion of independence actually encodes both freeness and classical independence because it is a richer notion. Okay, and it also encodes other notion of non-commutative independence that appear in the theory. Okay, so and we will see how to, to compute things like this. The interest of what has been uh, discovered since about uh, 20 years in these free probability techniques is that we, just, we don't have just a, a conceptual framework. We have analytic tools with this. The subordination property and all the numerical methods that you, you may use in random matrix theory have a, a great theory of analysis in this non-commutative setting. Okay, so this is what we call free harmonic analysis. Pre-harmonic analysis maybe uh, is a word that I'm afraid uh, it is a bit strange, but think about the Stilges transform, the R transform, and what you heard about. This is just a, a word to, to sum up this, okay? So 10 years ago, uh, I developed this uh, theory to, to deal with this uh, kind of weird ensembles. And I was asking, can we develop the analog of pre-harmonic analysis? And it's not just a question for fun, it's just because the theory that we had for five or six years was just combinatorial, in the sense that we had a theory where we are able to compute the spectrum in a, more cases, but computing means having moments of the empirical distribution. And if you know the moments of a distribution, you don't know a lot of its qualitative properties. Not, you don't know what is the behavior of uh, so if there is a density or something like this. And uh, with the team that uh, joined me uh, in this question, we address this, this problem of finding uh, analytic tools. And what we discovered, and I will introduce this in the second lecture, is that if we take this theory, it has some things that I can mention, is the analog of conditional independence. independence. Okay, if you have a a function of x and z, a function of y and z, x, z, uh, f, x, y, and z are independent. 
these two functions are not independent because of the z, but they are independent uh, over z conditionally on this variable, right? Okay, this has an analog uh, invented uh, 40 years ago by Voculescu, which has a different name. It's called uh, amalgamation over an algebra. Okay, it's amalgamation is just because it's coming from group, group theory where it has a sense. Okay, just say it's the analog of conditional independence. It exists in the theory, and what we discover is that traffic independence implies a certain notion of conditional uh, independence uh, in this non-commutative way. And the result of that is that we can use the analytic tools, the free harmonic analysis in this setting, and we get algorithms that allow to compute eigenvalue distribution in this situation. Okay, so uh, this is an overview. This is maybe a lot of information for us uh, at the moment, so we will discover this in detail. Today, I will talk about some aspects which are classical in the theory of free probability. We will see how to compute the, uh, what is called the non-commutative distribution of several Wigner matrices. For this, uh, it will be the opportunity actually to introduce the traffic tools in the background, but I, I won't uh, put in the front of the theory. In the second lecture, I will uh, focus a bit more on the problem that we solved this with this, uh, these tools and go to this notion of freeness over the diagonal, which is this uh, analog of conditional independence we use to, to, to solve this question. Okay. Uh, these two topics will be very combinatorial. I will be dealing with moments and uh, using these combinatorial techniques of uh, traffic probability. In the last lecture, I will introduce more um, analytical problem how to, to deal with uh, this still just transform for these ensembles. And I will focus on this uh, um, outliers problems when we have finite trunk perturbation. So if the program is clear and uh, everyone is happy to, to start, let's go. And if you have any question, you have the opportunity to, to ask it right now. So what is a non-commutative polynomial? Is a question that um, typically uh, you take uh, a b plus b a, something like this. Uh, you can put a complex coefficient. Okay. So it's a linear combination of words in the matrices. And when I say word, I mean the, the word a b is not the word b a, it's the other matter. Okay. Hello. Let's start with some basic notions in RMP. And specifically, what I, I want to do right now is to give you a, a short zoology of random matrices. Zoology. So RM is a shortcut uh, for random matrices for us today. Okay. So what kind of random matrices you, do you know? You know these covariance matrices with IID entries. We heard about this, so I won't go back. But I, will, I want to define uh, properly or recall the definition of a Wigner matrix because we will compare with different ensembles. So if you miss this definition, it will be a problem. A Wigner matrix, what is it? I will call it X and So it's a real or complex matrix, which we assume to be Hermitian. We assume that the entries of the form xaj over square root of n. Implicitly, we have a, a noise which is quite small. We divide it by uh, some um, very small amplitude. Okay, so we have small fluctuations. Okay, we assume that uh, so the matrix is emission. It is right and like this. We assume that the uh, uh, upper diagonal entries are iid independent of the diagonal entries, which are IID also, uh, as well, 
Of course, if your matrix is complex, uh, you have different uh, distribution in general. And we assume that, uh, let's say, the entries are centered. It is not very important, but let's say that. And we have a finite variance. And I will assume for us, for using these techniques, that we have finite moments of any order, all orders. But the really important uh, assumption is that this is finite for k equals two. Otherwise, with truncation argument, you will manage to, to deal with, uh, with that. Okay. So you may know Wigner's theorem, and we will give a proof of that, which tells us that the empirical eigenvalue distribution of a Wigner matrix, Xn, converge to a, what is called the semicircular distribution. Yeah, but if you have a complex matrix, you have complex entries there and real entries there. So, and you don't really care about the detail of the diagonal entries. Actually, what is important is only the variance of the diagonal entries. For this theorem, you have universality. This result does not depend on the exact distribution we put uh, on the entries. Okay, the so semicircular distribution, if the variance is two, uh, as a support, minus two, two, and this result tells you that your eigenvalue will be, uh, most of the eigenvalue will be uh, around this interval. And if you draw a, for a finite by large size matrix, an histogram, it will be very close to the semicircular. Okay. So the second matrix that I want to consider is, so it looks diff, uh, very similar to this one, but the behavior is different. We called it, let's say, uh, a Bernoulli matrix. We consider a real symmetric matrix where the Xn Aj are Iid, but we don't assume that they are normalized like this with a random variable whose distribution is independent on n, and such that we assume that these guys are Bernoulli random variables of very small parameter. Let's fix an integer p and take a Bernoulli random variable, a parameter p over n, which means that with probability p over n, which is very small, this guy is one, otherwise it is zero. Okay, and so this is a Roos matrix. If you want, you center the matrix by removing uh, p, uh, p over n on all entries, and you normalize the variance. But it is uh, it is good like this. This guy, so uh, let maybe I should use uh, another symbol like uh, y. The Empirical eigenvalue distribution of this guy has a limit which is very different from the semicircular distribution. It converges to a guy that I will call uh, L of Y, just a symbol to refer to the limit of matrices, but you know, free probability will give a meaning for this Y, but which depends on this parameter P. Okay? And this measure is very singular. Right? It's not, uh, we don't have an expression. There is no density uh, in general. And uh, knowing the properties of this distribution is complicated. Having an expression for moments is quite easy, but knowing really what is distribution is complicated. And in particular, if you take a generic random matrix or a deterministic matrix, and you consider this matrix plus such a matrix, you won't have the same phenomenon as what you do with a Wigner matrix. A deterministic plus a Wigner matrix, in general, uh, under the good assumption, will have a, an eigenvalue distribution will converge to the free convolution of the two eigenvalue distribution. But for this kind of matrices, this is not true. But we will see that freeness over the diagonal gives a good solution. 
and not only in the solution, but also the algorithm and the numerical method to compute concretely the spectrum. Okay. Yes. Why the the, res the universality results like of uh, Tau and Wu, for example, does not apply to Bernoulli matrices? Because it's not a Wigner matrix. In this situation, you have a field of small random variable divided by n. Here you have a random matrix where you have some entries, most of entries are zero, and some entries are one. You know, it's, it's actually, uh, there is a model which is uh, similar to this one, which are uh, Wigner-like matrices with heavy tailed entries. That is, you remove the assumption that the second moment is finite. You have a Cauchy distribution. You must normalize such a matrix in a different way. And then you will see the same phenomenon. There is no universality. You will depend on the evidential distribution. And if you look at the sum of such a matrix with a deterministic matrix, it will be the convolution over the diagonal that gives a solution. There is a, a question, sir, Yes, yeah. it's you solved it for yourself. Can you, uh, the question is, do we, if we replace the Bernoulli by Hanmacher, Hanmacher is a symmetric Bernoulli? No, yeah, but it's just, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's just shifting the matrix. So yes, you can do that. What is important is to have a, a matrix which is not uniform in the noise. You know, you have some entries which are very big compared to the other. And here big is just being one compared to zero, but for every tailed entries, that is clear that you have some entries which are huge. No, but, but then Rademacher, I think it would be like a Wigner matrix. Because... It depends. If you divide your Rademacher by square root of n. No, Rademacher would, would, would have all the entries. Uh... Ah, it's symmetric plus or minus yes, one. Yes. So and a, then you divide by square root of n. So, okay, you will probably. It depends on kind of. Uh... If you think of the symmetric Rademacher, you will need to. Normalize it like this, yeah, yeah, you but know. you can cook something which is a bit weird. But you have to to have something which is really not symmetric. So it's yeah. maybe not what was. So I guess you get a Bernoulli Rademacher where you have many zeros and the other entries are minus one and one. Maybe, yeah. You you must cook something which is very uh, unbalanced. Okay. Okay. Okay, we will talk about uh, Ranoir uh, uh, anti wise products, don't worry, but uh, it will be another subject. Yes? Absolutely. And more generally, so there is an other kind of matrices which are the heavy tail. There are other kinds of graphs which are adjacency matrices of sparse graphs. If you like this kind of graphs and look at the eigenvalue of polynomials of this adjacency matrix with, with something else, you are in this kind of bad ensembles or weird ensembles for which we will need freeness over the diagonal and not just the plain notion by your equilibrium. Okay. okay, so this is just to give so a sample of uh, matrices. So per, uh, matrices of graph was in my list. Uh, I want to conceptualize something a bit more general, but about these two notions. As you know, uh, there is, as you maybe know, there is one Wigner matrix, which is very specific, which is a GUE matrix, which is very important in the theory. And it is important because it is a unitarily invariant matrix. Morning, we say uh, um, rotationally invariant. This is the same notion, but here in the, the complex case, we have when we have a matrix A n, it is unitarily invariant. It is if it is equal in distribution to the matrix U A n U star, and this for any U which is a unitary matrix. Again, a matrix which sees property will be a nice matrix that we'll consider with the theory of Euclidus. And uh, obviously, the matrix that we consider with this theory, they have a weaker assumption, which is the following. 
that we call permutation invariant matrices. The permutation, I mean, uh, invariant by conjugation by any permutation matrix. So that's a matrix that is invariant. Uh, the definition is quite simple when we have this one, but this is assumed for all permutation matrix. Okay, so if you just know this assumption, you don't know a priori if Voiculescu theory will work. It may happen, but not necessarily. But you can be confident that uh, freeness over the diagonal and traffic independence should say something interesting about this ensemble. Okay. Okay, and if you take, you consider the matrices which were on this blackboard, the ardosh rini graph, the Ibernoui matrix, they satisfy this assumption. Okay. This assumption is not really satisfied for Wigner matrices, but we don't really need the matrices to strictly be unitarily invariant. We just need that asymptotically the eigenvectors are more or less uniform. And actually, this is what happened for Wigner matrices. They are not exactly unitarily invariant, but we don't care. It's uh, almost the same. Okay. And just to mention that this assumption is quite uh, it's more natural than this, in the sense that if you, you consider uh, uh, T uh, vectors, there is much more chance that it is invariant when you exchange the vectors than invariant when you apply an orthogonal matrix that will uh, mix all the entries. So for the point of view of modelization, it is clear that it will be much easier to justify this kind of assumption than this one. Of course, if this one works, it will give you a more efficient algorithm, but just you can uh, start uh, safely assuming this, and it's more difficult to be in this situation with this unitary invariance. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, of course. So, what is a permutation matrix? Uh, it's a matrix. So, you have sigma. Permutation of uh, one n. So for me, one n. I will denote it with a bracket like this. So just it's just a bijection of uh, this ensemble. Okay. And uh, the permutation, the v is the matrix associated to sigma if uh, v a j is indicator than I think that the good definition will be this one, but you, you choose a convention. I think that this is the one I use uh, in my works. Okay. So it's just a way to encode the permutation in the matrix. This will result in a matrix where in each row and colon, you have one entries, which is on zero. For instance, this block tells us that you exchange one and two. Uh, no, it says that these two guys are a fixed point. And this guy say you exchange three and four. Okay, so just a, a way to encode the permutation. Just to have a more uh, basic way to see that, if you are given a matrix AN, what is this matrix? It's a matrix which describes the same operator as AN, but you just exchange the order of the vector of the basis when you express the operator. Okay. Okay. This is a different way to, to see that. Other questions? Okay, if not, uh, well, let's go on. We have 10 minutes to give a, a little bit of um, free probability uh, theory. Then in the second part of the lecture, we will consider the distribution of Wigner matrices. Okay, so now that we have some uh, characters to, 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 to tell a story, Let's consider the, a, good, a good framework. So what is a non-commutative random variable? Random variables. So I will try to avoid a, a very abstract lecture, uh, but I will give you some ingredients that we will use in practice. The, the formalism is quite simple compared to classical probability. A non-commutative probability space 
is the data of a couple A phi. A is a space and phi is the expectation. The space is an algebra. Just um, a field where you can do products. And we assume that it is a non-commutative algebra, typically an algebra generated by random matrices or matrix algebra. And phi is a linear map, a linear form. That is, it's a linear map from A to the field of complex numbers. And it tells you what is the expectation of A if A is an uncommutative or numerable. In classical probability, you define sigma fields, you define some uh, with very difficult axioms. Here, it's much more apparent. There are a little bit of assumptions that we can assume uh, that I will not want to uh, tell so much, but we also assume that uh, these guys are endowed with an application star, which is from A to A, which is a nonlinear uh, non involution, such as the complex uh, conjugate of matrices. Antilinear involution, such that when you take the star of a product, you exchange the order of the product as from the complex transpose of matrices. Okay. Why we want to start? Because we want a notion of positivity. I will not uh, explain all the all the details about. It. But let's consider examples of uh, this kind of ensembles of spaces which are related to random matrices. So first, before random matrices are random variables. Uh, example one, you have uh, omega fp, a classical probability space. How to see that the classical probability space is a non commutative probability space? That way, we consider as an algebra the algebra of uh, bounded. Uh, non commutative, uh, no, bounded commutative random variable defined on omega with value and complex number. And this symbol just means that the, the random variable, I assume they have moments of all orders, right? And for phi, I will consider the expectation. So the expectation, it's a linear form and it's always uh, well defined on this algebra. And uh, the star is just the complex, uh, complex conjugate, right? Complex conjugate. Okay, just to say that this setting of non commutative probability is an extension of uh, the notion of uh, probability space of complex random variables. There is, of course, a restriction with this. We want to develop all the probability setting. So the second example is the example of matrices or random matrices. Let's take for A, an algebra generated by some matrices, by certain matrices. You can take the full matrix algebra, but you can restrict to uh, matrices you are given and you want to study. Okay, and phi, I will, I will put n as for the size of matrices, and n by n matrices. And this expectation that we consider in this non commutative uh, setting is one over n the traits. Okay, why it is an expectation, we'll see just in a, in a moment, but we, it, we, it plays the role of an expectation. And if you're considering random matrices of certain n by n random matrices, you can combine these two settings and just you will put an expectation here. And this will be row setting. I did not mention, but this uh, guy is a complex uh, conjugate. 
complex transpose. I don't know how you call it. Right? Okay, we have defined the object, but as in classical probability, this is not what matters. What matters is the notion of distribution. In probability, this is really uh, the notion we should focus on. How you realize the random variable is not really uh, important. So let's talk about the notion of non commutative distribution. Okay, so definition. So given a family of non-commutative random variables, so I will denote this family with this bold uh, symbol, just means that it is a collection of guys indexed by some index J. Okay, so we consider this guy in, in our safety. So that, this is a collection of an element of A. This is what we call non-commutative random variables. And we call the so distribution, we call it the star distribution to distinguish from the usual notion of distribution and because it involves a star. That's just a trick. The star distribution of A is, so it is a linear map which gives you all the complex number you can compute from A given in this setting. So if you are given a family of variable like this, because you are in algebra, what you can do is make making products sum and multiplying by uh, complex numbers. That is considering a non-commutative polynomial in the variable. In the variable and in their adjoint, because we have this star. Okay, so this gives you variables. And then you can apply phi, and it gives you complex numbers. And we can sum up like this. This map, we will note it phi index A, because it's very it's given by phi. It takes P. It is a non-commutative polynomial. Now, I should, uh, OK, I should introduce some symbols. The set of non-commutative polynomials in some family X will be denoted like this with this uh, bracket. And here it's X and X star because we will have a family and the variable with the star. Uh, just X is just a family of undeterminates. They are symbols uh, which are uh, indexed by the same ensemble. And so, okay. so this, this is just a uh, word in symbols where is, there is an obvious way to replace this symbol by the variable under consideration. Okay. And you associate phi of this polynomial. So maybe I have uh, chosen a way very uh, obscure to define it. But an example of this is just taking phi of uh, a1, a2 uh, plus uh, a2 star a1 to the third, which is the third power, A2, okay? If you evaluate your linear form in a non-commutative polynomial, you, you get a complex number. And this is what we call a non-commutative moment or star moment called Sure, just uh, it's a notation for the space of non commutative polynomials in some variables. So here I just denoted a family of variables, xj in xj's and xj's star. We should have avoided to use this notation. It is quite confusing. We will not uh, use it anymore later. Okay. It's just the notion of non-commutative distribution is the data of non-commutative moments or star moments. And for the moment, it's kind of uh, abstract, but it's evaluating for us. And we start with this uh, in the second part of the lecture, the expectation of the normalized traits of any polynomial in the matrix. So this is the end of the first part of the lecture. We have a 15 minutes break. And we will illustrate more concretely what is this definition and what we are going to compute with that. Thank you.
Here we are. Jean, do you want? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's resume this. So we finish the session with this kind of abstract definition and we're going to illustrate in the two examples that we have considered before. So you know what is the notion of distribution in classical probability? The distribution is a map where for every, uh, let's say, bounded uh, measurable function, you associate the expectation of f of x, where x is a collection of random variables. And this is a collect the data of these numbers which characterize the distribution. You also know that you have other way to, to characterize the distribution, which may be very convenient, such as the characteristic function. If it is allowed a density or accumulative functions for one variable and so on, okay? But here, this is one notion. What do we have here? We have something which is almost this, but a bit more restrictive. Here, so just, Right, the classical notion of distribution. Notion of distribution and where F is a measurable bounded. Okay, versus the non-commutative notion. The restriction, it is, is, it is more algebraic. The non-commutative distribution or star distribution will be the collection where for each polynomial, and in this context, so it is not relevant to consider a non-commutative polynomial, just the order doesn't matter when you evaluate two complex random variables. So just a classical polynomial that you denote maybe in C crochet X, X bar, okay, polynomial in the variable and their uh, conjugate, and you associate the expectation of the polynomial in these variables. What What's the name for this? This is called the moment. Okay. So there are the moments, the joint moments, if you have several variables, of uh, the variables. Okay. So does the moment is really the distribution of variable? Not always. If you have a very weird distribution, maybe it has no moment. Maybe it is not characterized by its moment. If you take the log normal distribution, the moments are defined, but there are different distributions with the same moment. But they are very weird situation. If you have a Gaussian random variable or a sub Gaussian random variable, a bounded random variable, it is entirely characterized by its moment. So just to sum up, there is uh, the main part of a classical probability where if you know moments, it's the same as knowing the distribution. And there are some random variables which are not where this is not true. And this is maybe a problem if you want to see free probability as an extension of classical probability, but that's the life. We just restrict to this algebraic notion. Okay, but we, we don't really care about this. We care about random matrices. So what we must know is what is the notion of non-commutative distribution for matrices and why do we care? Okay, given a family of matrices, uh, Xn, let's call them Xn, Xln. Those questions, no? Okay. The non-commutative distribution is the data of the expectation of one over N, the trace if you take one matrix, L1, let me uh, remove the dependence on N and the matrices, just a question of uh, clarifying the notation, times a second matrix, times another matrix, and you take either the matrix or it's a joint that I will encode with uh, this index here. And this is so for all L1, so for all big L, 